quick sec on live here. Let me just make sure my mic's working. Awesome. Microphone is working. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cameras Today. We'll be teaching the Camera Basics class. Let me switch to the presentation for my online people to see. Um, but today we're basically going from a smartphone, you had a phone camera, maybe you owned a camera 20 years ago, or maybe you've never touched a camera at all. This is the class for you. So today we'll talk about shooting through the camera on your automatic settings. We're going to talk about um, additional accessories um, that you might want for your camera. We're going to talk about the memory cards, making sure you're saving images right. And then the big portion of the class we're, are going to be two things. One, the layout of the camera. We're going to talk about the buttons everywhere on there. And that's where, as you guys have questions, ask them. And then we're going to talk about framing an image up. Because we're shooting an automatic for the most part in this class today, the camera's going to do all our work for us as far as aperture, shutter, and um, ISO is concerned. We're mainly focused on what we're seeing through the camera lens as we're viewing. Um, so we'll give it another about four minutes here and then we'll get started on the class. Is working, but I want there we go. Okay, USB camera back on, and my audio is also going. Audio, audio, audio is going perfect. A couple weeks ago, I was teaching a class, and my audio wasn't popping up, and I got all these messages on the side telling hey. me, and I couldn't. Yeah, I was in the middle of it, so I'm like, all right, guys, this is kind of where we're at. Luckily, I teach the same course every month. Um, basically, what makes it different is sometimes I'll have people from the uh, audience ask questions, or I'll have different prompts that come mm -hmm. up, or different things I've thought about during the week that I might throw in as little tidbits or mentions. So, yeah. I right. see. Actually, I got a bunch of viewers. Up. So, you know, I'm just going to jump right into okay, it. Go ahead. Welcome to Camera Basics, everybody. This is one of our longer classes that we're teaching. Um, there's just a bunch to go over. I would say next week, Camera Intermediate will be our busiest. Um, so not to keep everybody from waiting, let's get right into the class. Let me just slide this over, and then that gives me the ability to view if you guys have any questions. Perfect. All right. Camera basics, where to go when all else fails, when you need help. First thing I tell everybody is to start by reading your owner's manual. Um, nowadays, with how much everything's going digital, there's a lack of paper representation in a lot of these boxes when you buy a new product. They don't give you an instruction manual. They don't. These companies, though, because they're making a move to go away from paper, they put them all online. So you can find all this stuff online if you look. But it is really helpful to get it in person or to get at least somebody who's explaining it word of mouth. So that's why I like the other uh, resource of YouTube. If there is a single question, there's so many like plumbing or carpentry things I'm doing in my house nowadays. I, I just reinstalled our bathtub on our second floor and I've never done anything with plumbing in my life. I learned it all on YouTube. Uh, but it saved me 600 bucks. So when all else fails, the owner's manual, the YouTube is a great source. Um, what I tell people who are just starting if you can learn the very basics of your camera, type in 10 things you didn't know about whatever the model of your camera is. 
somebody out there on YouTube has made a video dedicated to only your camera and they'll take 20, 30 minutes explaining some key features that maybe set your camera aside from other cameras. So worth taking a look for, especially if you're brand new. And then Masterclass, I don't really talk about it as much, but during the pandemic it was really popular. A bunch of um, very famous people in their craft, musicians, cooks, writers, actors, they took to Masterclass to teach people about like what they do and how they do it and how they became professional at it. So it's another good resource if you want to learn from pros in the industry. Um, they do have some camera and photography based stuff on there, even some photo editing stuff from what I've seen. So the first topic that we're going to get into is, in my opinion, the most important. It's where do pictures go and make sure you have two of them. So we're talking about SD cards. When you buy a camera in the store today, a couple things that you need to have. Right off the bat, you need a camera body. That's your bread and butter. That's your brains of the operation. Then you need a lens. Your lens is basically the heart. It's everything else. If you don't have a lens, the camera body won't function. But as long as you've got a lens and a camera body, you're going to have a good system going. But there's one piece of information they don't tell you right off the bat, and it's kind of expected to know in the industry, is SD cards. Most cameras, unless you're buying one of those like GoPro action-based cameras. Hi there, welcome in. Here for the camera class? Yes. Welcome in here. Let me hold the door for the next person coming in. Have a seat anywhere that you like. Can I get you a water bottle? Oh, yes. So we just got into the very beginning of it. So the first slide, I just kind of talk about where you should be looking when you need to go for help. First thing is the owner's manual. Some of these new cameras, you're not going to see owner's manuals anymore. They get rid of paper products. But if you go on their website, it should give you that. And then YouTube is my biggest one that I always recommend. YouTube has everything on there. What I just told this gentleman is when you get a brand new camera, just in general, go on YouTube, type in 10 things you didn't know about, whatever the camera model it is. Somebody out there has made a 30, 40 minute video dedicated to just your camera, and they'll tell you every little bit under the sun you want to know. Um, while cameras are typically very universal and they have a very generalized feel to them, every camera can do something a little different. Nikon does something that different than Canon. Canon does something different than Sony. They're all unique, but all very similar. And that's kind of what the class is all about and, and what I teach is the generalized way to understand your camera before you start playing with stuff. So the first thing we're getting into is the SD cards. Now it's important because with cameras, no camera that you purchase, unless it's one of those small little action cameras, none of them are going to come with storage. So it's important that when you're buying a camera, the three things that you need to get started is a camera body, a camera lens, and an SD card. Your SD card is going to be your storage. It's very similar to tapes, to film, to everything. So the SD card can be in a various amounts of different sizes. The smallest you're going to see most of the time nowadays is 16 gigabytes. Um, a gigabyte is a standard unit of measurement in the digital world. Um, one gigabyte is 100 megabytes, and you can go even smaller than that. I believe 1,000 gigabytes is one terabyte. Um, for these SD cards though, the numbers you're going to see consistently is it goes in intervals of 16. So it goes 16, 32, then it jumps from 32 to 64, then from 64 to 128, 128 to 256, 256 to 512. For the person who's just taking fo uh, photos, they're not really concerned about video, 32 to 64 is going to get you anywhere in the ballpark of about, let's say, 10,000 to 20,000 photos, give or take. This is before you upload them to the computer, you delete photos, you do anything with it. Let's say you go on a nine-day cruise, you're not touching a computer, but you bring your camera with you. You should comfortably, between 32 and 64, be able to take about 10 to 30,000 photos, I would say. If you want to take video, you can. But I would recommend, if that's the case, 64 gigabyte or higher would be better. 128 is usually a good size. Video is going to take up substantially more room than photos. When you think about a video, you think about a video as being little bits of frames. If you break a video down, it'll almost look like you have all these individual photo stills next to each other, 
and when they're played in motion, we then see a video. So that's kind of the way that you're thinking about it, is that if a photo is only taking up, let's say, like five megabytes, uh, a video is going to take up even more than that. Um, again, might be getting over the head on that one, but I would say for people who are just getting into it, 32 to 64 is great for the average photography user. Anything for video, you want to go 64 or higher. Now, you can get into the read and write speed of these guys, but it really only uh, uh, matters to a certain degree when you're talking about video. The better or faster the read and write speed of your SD card is, the better it'll move a video to your computer so then you can edit it or share it to friends and family, that sort of thing. If you're not doing any video aspect and you're only doing photo, you shouldn't have to worry too much about the read and write speed, especially as a beginning photographer. But I have a question on the read and write speed. Is that indicated somewhere on the yeah. disc where you buy it? So what am I looking for? My people on my internet won't be able to see me, but on this stuff, you'll see it on the card here. A lot of the times the card will list a certain number followed by MB-S, that's megabytes a second. Some cards, like Sony, will even break it down to the read is this speed, the write is this speed. Some SD cards won't even have that on there. They're going to have the V30 or they're going to have speeds on there. The speed only tells you so much. you got to Google it online to see what it is. But you'll see, for example, most of these have a speed written on them. Now, most of these all have the speed on there. You should see the speed written on all these. I'm looking at every single one of these cards. Say that one more time. Speed with what again? So it'll be the speed MB slash S. MB slash S. Yes. If you look at your SD cards currently, you should see an MB slash S. That'll tell you the speed at which it's reading and writing the data. Let's see if I can help you find it. It'll be on the other side. And some of these cards won't say it. The ProMaster ones, for my knowledge, don't. But it shows you it's a V30, right. so this should be that? roughly around 30 or 70 megabytes a second. Oh, okay. So it should be a very standard SD card. Okay, all right. Now, I always like to have two when I go out on a photo shoot of any kind. Even if I'm on vacation, I bring like six of them with me. My biggest fear in life is that if one doesn't work and you only have one with you, then you're SOL. Uh, having two with you just as a backup is, is peace of mind. For me, if when I go do anything, I like to have one extra battery with me and about two extra SD cards just to be on the safe side. I'm a little overkill on that. Always have two SD cards. You can get a real small one, a 16 gigabyte, just to have it. But if one doesn't work and for some reason when you put it in the camera, it's not saving the photos, um, that's where the second one would then come into effect. Now, when we're going through this, one of the things I like to tell everybody at the very beginning of this class is that the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. Cameras is one of the few art forms that I always make the argument with. It doesn't matter if you're Picasso and you can make uh, beauty out of nothing. If you have a bad camera, it's going to be a bad photo. Um, the more money that you invest into your photography and to everything else, the better results you're going to get at the very end of it. So always look for the deal, always get the best thing. But if it's a question on you know spending a little bit more to get something a little bit better, probably would push you to go that route if you have the money to save afterwards. Um, it's one thing, but if you have the ability to spend it on whatever you're getting when you're getting there, I would recommend doing it. Um, and the, the main one that it pertains to is lenses. Lenses are going to be the most expensive out of both of your sets because you both have, you have a P, is that a Coolpix or is that a, Coolpix. that is the Coolpix. Okay, so you don't have any interchangeable lenses, so no. yours is a little different. You do have the interchangeable right. lenses. Right. So for people with interchangeable lenses, the joke in the community is marry your body, or marry your lens, date your body. Your body is going to get outdated and is going to become kind of slower as time goes on, but your glass is going to stay amazing the entire time if you keep it up. Um, so in the future, what would be recommended is, you know, that camera body should last you anywhere between about 10 to 15 years before it really starts to slow down. In that time frame, it would be good to upgrade the glass, get more glass, more lenses, better quality. And then eventually, when the new camera is needed, you can move over all the lenses you've already bought into the new camera, and then you don't have to buy all those new lenses for a brand new camera. That's kind of the thought process behind it. Um, moving back into SD cards, though, your pictures shouldn't live on the memory card. The idea of the memory card and the SD card is that when the photo is taken with the camera, that image comes through the camera. Now, depending on the camera style, you both have mirrorless cameras. Yours is a point-and-shoot model. Yours is the mirrorless. 
Um, but the way that it basically works is that you have a sensor on the inside of the camera. You, your image is coming through the camera and the lens. It hits the image sensor. The image sensor then displays the image on the back LCD screen that you have. And then it transfers that image into the SD card, which is located usually where the battery is on the camera or in a separate compartment on the side. From there, you have a couple different options of what to do with the photo. And this is what I would recommend just so that way you keep good practice of storing your photos, but then you always have a paper trail to get back to your photos. I always use the scenario of the spilled coffee. Um, I went to the School of the Art Institute for college and uh, our laptops were our entire life. It had all our artwork on there, projects, everything. Uh, I had a kid in my class who spilled a cup of coffee on his laptop and he never backed anything up, never did anything. He lost 15 years worth of work. Like every photo that he had taken when he was a kid, his professional career to now, gone. So the practices that I use for this is the best way to basically ensure that you've got your photos in multiple locations. So if the laptop goes missing, you know, the kids spill a coffee on the computer, something goes wrong, you've got more access to them. You've got more availability to them. So the very first thing you should do, you've taken your photos, you're done, you went to the park, you went on vacation, turn your camera off and wait at least five seconds. When you initially turn that camera off, you can hear the gears in the camera starting to slow down, and then you'll kind of hear them go kaput, where then you'll hear no more sound out of the camera, it won't vibrate, it won't do anything. Typically, you'll hear like a shutter noise, that just means that the sensor is turning like a little shutter in front of it, um, and then it's just powering down, not allowing for any more information to be recorded into the um, brains of the camera. From there, you can remove the card, um, now for everybody it's a little different for your camera your card should be next to the battery for yours I believe it lives in its own spot no it's, in the, it's right also, next to the battery also right next to the battery right, right here got it right there so you'll pop that card out now you can there's two options here my best practice is to first remove the card and then place into a card reader a lot of the times though with the cameras that you're buying they give you a cable with the camera and that cable you can also plug into the computer I got no issue with it my biggest fear, my point of contention is that you've got too many, you've got a lot of electronics plugged in and you've got a lot more room for something to go wrong. Not saying anything will go wrong, but let's say your, com uh, your uh, camera is plugged into your computer and as you're transferring photos over, there's an error within the transfer. There's a small possibility, but still a possibility that the photos that are transferring from the camera to the computer could delete themselves on accident or could get lost in the translation. While that's happening, there's kind of is no way to get your photos back if something were like that were to happen. So best practice and what I found is removing the physical SD card and getting a card reader. And on the next slide I show some pictures of what those look like. Um, you can find them on Amazon for a few bucks. Uh, you can also get really high-end ones for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's really up to your choice on that one. The more expensive ones are made more for video. So again, it's kind of getting into it a little bit more. The higher quality video that you're going to, that's when a higher quality SD card reader. For very big basics or intro, you probably don't need anything too fancy or to break the bank too much. Now, don't use your camera to read the card or send pictures to the computer is what that last line is supposed to lead. On most of these new cameras, and I know yours for sure, is yours the cool Pix950 or the 1050? So you should have it as well too. There's Wi-Fi Bluetooth features on both of your devices. You can connect your phone to it via an app. You can download all the images that you're taking from the physical uh, device to your phone. You can do that. I only recommend that you do that to send, let's say, five to 10 photos at a time. The only reason is that the battery life on the camera and the battery life on the phone can deplete very quickly from doing so if you're on safari in Africa, you've only got one battery in there, you want to transfer 50 photos over because Betty back at Chicago wants to see your vacation a little bit, you want to send her some photos, you could completely uh, drain the whole battery right on that and not be able to use your camera anymore. So using the remote transfer feature is really nice, but I only recommend doing that for a couple photos. If you have just came back from vacation or you just came back from botanical gardens and you want to transfer all your photos and you've got more than, let's say, 60, you should be using a card reader, or you should at least be plugging the uh, camera into the computer and then transferring over. Um, but my rule of thought is always to remove the card and place into the card reader for the best transfer. Examples of card readers can look like this. The little trifecta in the center is actually my personal favorite on there. It has a USB and a USB-C end, so it fits in almost every single computer nowadays. 
Um, but that would allow you to put in either SD cards from either of those two cameras that you have right there, and then transfer all the images. You mean the one that looks like a USB stick? Yep. That's exactly. right there. Okay. Yeah. It's also one of the cheapest ones out there that you can get. And the only reason I'd recommend that one over the other ones is the other ones are going to give you a lot more stuff that you don't need for what your cameras are capable of. Did you sell those here? Yeah, we do. Okay. But if it works, it works. Nothing like that. Yeah. Nice for compact on the go. I get a lot of people that, you know, they bring their laptops or their iPads with them everywhere they go. So they need to transfer photos immediately. So having something a little smaller and compact is nice. But even if you got an older one, the technology is roughly the same. Nothing's really changed. If you were shooting with a much more higher end camera, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of one, I would probably tell you to then move towards a nicer card reader for the benefit of that. But with what you're using, I'm sure whatever card reader you got is just fine. So then, once you've now put your SD card into the computer, you plugged your camera into the computer, now you need to physically move the photos. Now, we don't want to move photos from the uh, destination folder. So, we want to copy the photos. We don't want to move. Now, when I say don't move copy, when you're first doing everything and you plug in, so if you're on Windows or you're on Mac-based computers, depending on what you got at home, um, you're going to have the option to take everything from the SD card and move it onto the computer. You can make a folder for that. You can plug in another hard drive. Everybody does it a little bit differently how they want to do it. But I recommend copying them over. What that's doing is that's making it a duplicate copy of the photos that are on the SD card. And what you're insuring yourself on is let's say that something happens and you know the, the camera gets unplugged. <laughs> if you're moving the stuff over, just like we talked about earlier, that chance of things getting lost within the translation of transferring stuff over. If we're moving stuff, we have a greater risk of not being able to recover stuff if we don't if the photos don't show up. If we copy the stuff over and the copy doesn't go through, all of the photos we just tried to copy will still be on that SD card and we can try it again. Um, just helps with minimizing the chance of failure. After that, we want to copy them to one other place. Now, this can be a multitude of things. Your, full, your computer is one location, but I think of the spilled coffee thing. So I like to always have a second location as well. So moving them to an external drive, Prime Photos, which is already included if you have Amazon Prime. And if you have a Gmail, you also have Google Drive as well too. There's other stuff like Dropbox and Photo Album and a bunch of other ones too that you can sign up for. They're all a little different. These are the three that I've seen my customers have gravitated to, towards to, uh, the most. Um, I like the idea of cloud-based computing because let's say that you are in, on Safari in Africa. If you have a chance to sit down in a computer, you can transfer everything onto your Google Prime or your uh, Amazon Prime. And then when you're back in the States, you can go through and all the photos you took there are there. They're back in Chicago now. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit easier for traveling, less hardware. The only thing you'll have to remember are more usernames and passwords, which some people, it's the trade-off between do I carry more stuff or remember more usernames and passwords. And then the next step would be to eject the card before physically removing it. Never just take the SD card out of the computer. Never just unplug your camera. On a MacBook, it's as simple as clicking and dragging the item to the trash can. The trash can then becomes the eject button. Um, on Windows, if you go to the bottom right corner, you'll be able to find your device and you can click eject. That'll properly make sure that the SD card or the camera is shut off and that way you're not accidentally deleting information on there or um, not getting the information saved properly just in case. And then don't erase the card in the reader. When you're using these cards, um, when you put the card, uh, the SD card back into the camera, in the settings menu you can format the SD card. Um, so as soon as you insert the SD card, you go to your settings, you'll see format the card or format a card. You can click on it and it'll ask you yes or no. Once you say yes, it'll delete everything that's already on the card, but it'll reformat so that way whatever photo you're taking is optimized for that camera. It's hit or miss for me on that one. I don't necessarily think that's the only way to do it. If you feel more comfortable deleting all your information from your card, this is the only camera that you're using. I don't think there's any problem with you doing that. But let's say that you get another camera down the road. Now you've got one for your travel, one for personal use, or one for professional use, one for travel. That's where formatting the card becomes important because now you've got two different service, uh, servers that the camera's running on and you want to make sure that information is being stored properly on the card. So every new uh, SD card has 
has to be formatted before you start? You should. I mean, you don't have to. When are, you they, are they basically, are they, are you buy them and they're already preset or? Not really, no. Okay. But the, the thing with it is that for the most part, you you won't notice any hiccups with it. Um, I would say the only but time- it's still recommended formatting. Still, formatted, still recommended formatting, okay. 100%. Right. Okay. So if you're already taking photos on there and you've already got a bunch on there and you didn't format it, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Once you transfer everything onto your computer and then you put the card back in, then go ahead and format it. Okay. It'll clear everything that's on the SD card, but then it'll be more responsive towards the camera. And, and the places that I notice it's the biggest help is for size-wise. So if you've got a 64 or 32 gigabyte, you can only fit 20 to 30,000 photos. Let's say you're at that 29,999 photo. If you're not formatting your SD card, there's a chance you're not gonna get all the way up to 30,000 photos. Okay. So what that'll do is ensure that then you can get the most usage out of your SD card. That's the idea. This is your backup plan though. So the way I tell everybody is that it starts with your SD card. That's what's physically inside the camera. Once you've taken all your pictures, you go and click, click, click. You move over to the computer. You're plugging the SD card or the camera into the computer and you're getting all your information off of there. Now the photos can all live on the computer, but then in my personal opinion, they should live in one more spot. And you can either choose a hard drive, an external drive, and then they don't come any bigger than, a, than that, a little bit bigger than a cell phone. And, or you could do the cloud-based solution. So I just put a cloud up there. Uh, examples of cloud-based solution, I know we talked about Prime Photo, we talked about Google Drive. Um, Google Drive is probably one of the most popular out there. I have more and more people who use that because they all have Gmails. OneDrive is made by Microsoft, so if you have a Microsoft email, you should automatically have access to OneDrive. And then this one's a little out there, and it always sounds a little sales pitchy when I talk about it, but the Adobe Creative Cloud, you pay monthly for it. But if anybody's ever interested in doing photo editing or um, video editing or any type of just editing to whatever you're taking pictures of. Creative Cloud, you pay like different membership fees and then you get access to all those apps. So Lightroom, Photoshop, uh, InDesign, um, Premiere, all of the editing tools for art. And the one thing I really love about it was when we were in college, we would do critique where you would basically take your whatever piece you made, you'd hang it on the wall and all the students in the class would stand around it and tell you what they liked and didn't like about it. With Adobe Creative Cloud, you kind of get the same thing with that. So you get to put stuff up and say, hey, I just took this photo, I played with the colors, what do you guys think? And people can comment and tell you things they love, things they don't love, things to help you get maybe some extra effect that you're trying after. They can give you tips and tricks. So Creative Cloud's a really cool outlet to look at too. A uh, question on clouds. Yeah. Not to be a but how safe are clouds? I bet it's very safe. I mean, every once in a while you will hear the occasional somebody got hacked or this or that. I know uh, the last major one I think was with Apple and that was a couple years ago. Um, I rarely have any problems with customers. I'd say the biggest thing that customers run into is they don't know what they're saving to their cloud a lot of the times. And so they've got a lot of information in the cloud, but they either get confused on how to we'll access it lost. or how to delete stuff out of there. Right. I rarely hear any problems with it going through. I'd say the only other time it becomes muddy is if you have multiple people on your same cloud. Like we get people in the store who come as a family for their cell phones and they'll come in with their Apple, you know, Apple phone and they'll have the Apple cloud on there. Um, and they're sharing it with four other members of their family. So everybody's sending something up to the cloud. So it's all this information that's up there that, I've, that we've got to then help them figure out where, what goes where. So I would say that's the it, hard biggest issue. But as far as security, safety, information being stolen or taken away from you, I rarely hear any instances of that. Unless for some reason you're not making a complicated enough password or you're using the same information for multiple accounts and you're not checking that type of login, that sort of thing. Okay. So now we're gonna jump into a tour of your camera. Um, I feel free to turn your camera on, play with it a little bit. We're gonna talk about the buttons, the different buttons and how they work. If you don't notice the button on your camera, don't fret. Most of the time, some of these cameras have changed in, in the way that they lay the buttons out. So the button itself might be on the inside menu system of your camera rather than on the outside. So to start off in the top, if we're looking at the very top view of the camera, so you've got your camera in front of you and you're looking down at it, the lens is pointed straight up in the air. The very first button you're going to see on the top and the very first button we call out is the video start and stop. On most cameras, they're going to have a red dot button on there and that's going to be your shortcut to start and stop your video. That's going to be the automatic video settings, so nothing fancy on there, uh, anything else. 
When you click on it, it should also then show you what your autofocusing is on there, um, what the um, space at which it's autofocusing, that sort of thing, and then it'll tell you record time, etc. Underneath that, we have our power switch. That's pretty self-explanatory. It turns the camera on and off. Um, a lot of the times you're going to notice that the, the turn on button, or power switch, is located by the shutter release. Sometimes you won't notice that. But a lot of the times the power button for the camera is next to the trigger for where the camera then takes the picture or doesn't take the picture. Exposure compensation is right underneath that. Um, so shutter release, just to go back into that, make sure I didn't miss it. That's your button to physically pull the trigger and take your photo. So shutter release, one click, you'll hear those shutters going inside the camera. Exposure compensation, now exposure compensation is much like ISO. It's the light involved with your camera. ISO controls the amount of light the camera is letting into it. Exposure compensation can kind of temporarily lighten or darken the sensor that you're taking a photo of, or the sensor inside your camera as you're taking a photo. You'll most likely see a little square on your camera and it'll have a plus and a minus sign. The plus will be white with black around it and the minus will be white or will be black with white around it. When you click on that, if you're looking through the viewfinder, you'll start to maybe notice that a bar pops up on the bottom. And I think in the intermediate class, we talk a little bit more about exposure There's compensation. Yeah, you've got it as a dial. So it's a little different on yours. Here's mine. You might have yours on the inside of your camera. You've got it right on the side there. Here's just that button right there. So it's the plus and the minus. It's right off on the side. And there's your exposure compensation. So what you can do is button, it shows up, you can then turn the dial and it'll expose or overexpose depending, oh. and you go right back to zero. So if it's not light enough, you check it up, if it's not dark enough, you can check it out. Oh. Wow. And then when you're good to go, you just click OK. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So exposure compensation is great for a pickle. Some of the cameras will do it as a dial, other cameras will do it as a button, and then it pops up on the screen. Everyone's is a little bit different, but it's a nice way if you've already played with ISO, you've turned it up, if you go any higher higher with ISO, you're noticing grain on your photo. Exposure compensation brings more light into the camera without oversaturating or undersaturating the photo. But again, it's all up to your eye to see what you like more when you're playing with it. Now underneath exposure compensation, we have the mode dial. Um, the main mode we're talking about today is going to be automatic, and we'll jump into that at the end of the tour of the camera and, and get more into the, using the automatic settings. For anybody brand spanking new online, anybody here is brand spanking new, automatic means that the camera is going to do all the work for you. Typically, you're going to see an A+, that'll be automatic. You'll see a green camera on there, that'll be automatic. Or you'll see a green auto on that switch, that'll also be automatic. Um, what that basically means is that you don't have to worry about much other than pointing the camera and shooting. Now there's certain features that'll still be available and everybody's automatic is a little bit different. So that's where I would say research the camera online a little bit to see those certain, those certain features to see how that gets affected. Live view switch. So on your camera, some cameras have it, some don't. There's usually an LV button. The LV button stands for your live view. And what happens there is that's what toggles your view between only seeing things through your viewfinder on the top of your camera or through the screen of your camera, uh, the LCD screen. Now some of you might notice that if you put your hand above the viewfinder, that the screen will go black. That's because there's a sensor on the inside of your viewfinder that as soon as you put your hand in front of it, your screen automatically goes black. What is that? Right there. The little sensor right there. Your live view button, probably help you find the back of the glasses down and see. Your button is most likely on the inside menu of the camera. That's the one I showed you that one time when you couldn't get the screen on. I told you to push that button. No, that's right here. Yeah, that yep. one. That's the one. Your button's right there. So yours is a little bit different. So yours doesn't sell, say LV. Yours just has the little push button there. Yep. So that's your live view switch. So mode dial will go through the different modes of the camera. Automatic, manual, shutter priority, aperture priority. Live view switch will toggle the uh, viewfinder and the LCD screen that you have. And the command dial, command dial really will only come into play depending on what you have your mode dial set to. So if you're doing automatic, 
you have no control over the command dial. The command dial will stay the same. But let's say you're doing shutter priority, where you're controlling the speed at which the shutter is closing on the camera. That's where the command dial would come into play. The command dial would be your way to adjust the shutter speed. If you were in aperture or uh, yeah, aperture priority, same idea. Your command dial would then dictate the aperture on the actual camera itself. Um, so yeah, for what we're talking about, automatic command dial, don't have to worry about it. In the next class, the command dial comes into play a lot more. So from there, we'll move into the side of the camera. And again, everyone's camera might differ a little bit, so these buttons could be in a different location. This is one of Canon or Nikon's most popular DSLRs before they moved into mirrorless. Probably should make one based on the mirrorless cameras now that that's where we're headed. Flash button should be a little thunderbolt going down with an arrow. If you hit that button, your flash will automatically pop up. When it does that, that means the flash is engaged the whole time. If you close that down, um, let's say it's super sunny out, the flash button will not go off. But let's say you've got a little bit of overcast or it's sunny but you want to get more light on there, you click the flash button and the flash will go off no matter what. Now most mirrorless cameras will not have a flash. That's because mirrorless cameras can achieve an ISO much uh, higher than their DSLR counterparts or than some point and shoot models. So typically with a flash, a flash they could have put on a mirrorless camera is probably not going to be as good as a store-bought secondary flash to actually put on the top of your camera. So with your camera and how it is right now, you really don't need a flash unless you're taking real nighttime it photography. It goes up to 51, yeah. 200 I believe. There you go. And for yours, you've got a bridge, you've got the point and shoot model on there. They give you the flash just in case it's not enough, um, but you don't necessarily need the flash either because you've got a really high ISO too, depending on the, the photography that you're taking. So it will automatically select a low light Killer. right here. I think exactly. So that means your camera's gonna dictate, do all the work for you. Okay. I'm a big fan of that guy, just because of how they have the dials set up. I think they make it so easy for navigating and doing all that stuff. It's it's much more like a film camera, which is a, I, I okay. like the CFC. So we got that, now we got the function button. That's gonna be FN. Now everyone's function button will do something different. Typically, if you click the FN button on your camera, it might take you to another menu system. Sometimes it's a preset button that can then access a certain command or setting for you, but everybody's function button does something different. I would take the time, click on it to investigate, see what yours does specifically, see how that could benefit you. After that, we go to the lens. Now we've got a zoom ring on the lens. For some lenses, you might not see this. If you've got a prime lens, you won't have a zoom ring. But if you have any type of telephoto lens, so whether that is a 28 to 70 millimeter lens. That's the big, the big one and then the small one. Exactly, yes. Okay. So the big one on the physical lens is going to be the zoom ring. That's going to control the focal length. So that'll control how your lens is zooming forward and zooming back. The focus ring only comes into play if you're not using automatic focus on the camera. So in the camera's menu system when you're shooting, you can select whether you're doing continuous autofocus, single autofocus, or manual focus. If you'd like to do manual focus, the ring on the very front of the lens, and sometimes it can be positioned in the back of the lens too, everyone's a little bit different with how they set them up, typically it's in the front of the lens. That will control the physical focusing. And when you look either through the viewfinder or through the LCD screen at your subject matter you're taking a picture to, you should be able to see it go in and out of focus depending. Some lenses that don't have an advanced computer system will have a lens retract button. And all that basically means is that when you're not using the lens, you can snap it back into place, you'll hear a click, and that lens basically is going to be as compact or as small as possible. Let's say you go traveling, you're walking around with your, bag, your lens in your bag, the lens won't open itself in your bag and accidentally snap or anything bad will happen because it's locked into its shut place. Most of the newer mirrorless cameras, uh, you actually do have a lens retract button. I know if you turn it, you'll hear it, it'll, it'll click when it turns all the way to the one side. Yours just isn't a button, yours is just a regular click. So if you turn your lens from the focal point one, nope. What, sure. what do you mean by that? So if you put this guy on, so I'm going to turn it all the way to here, you're going to hear that oh, click. Your lens okay. won't move now. 
Okay. There's no physical button on the lens to retract it, but if you were to travel with this, it's not going to open oh, up right. by so itself. Not. Okay. Exactly, right. so you won't damage it. But then to get it started, you got to turn, and you'll hear that click when you do. Okay, when you work with that. All right. But that's a good way, and even if, let's say, you go to that lens retract and you have it on the camera, you turn the camera on, it'll tell you to detract or retract the lens so you can start using it. Some cameras have it, some don't. The button you did click, though, just a second ago, is your lens release button. Correct. So for mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, you have a button on the side of the camera that allows you to remove the lens to put a new one on. Point-and-shoot models don't have that. Um, but with point-and-shoot models, they give you everything in one camera, so you don't need to replace and put other lenses. Something like the P950, P1000, that's got great zoom and then good wide angle, so you don't need, you never need another lens. Uh, from there, then you've got your drive mode button. Drive mode is going to be symbolized by squares stacked on top of each other or by what looks like a timer button. And the drive mode is what's dictating how your camera is going to respond when you pull the trigger. So is it going to take a burst amount of shots? Is it going to take 10 photos at once? So are you doing, you know, like bird or wildlife photography? If you've got a bird going across, you probably want to do a burst shot because you want to make sure that you're getting the bird within a good wingspan so you don't get blurred. If you've got you know, a kid or somebody running in a track meet or doing football, you might want to also do burst because if they're running a touchdown into the end zone, one picture, you might get blurred. A burst of photo, you'll get more of that. Timer as well can be then thrown on there. Let's say that you're on vacation, you've got a tripod ahead of you. You could set the camera on the tripod <laughs> back up and then it'll do a 10 second burst before it then takes the photo. The cool part is, is that the apps that come with most of these uh, cameras now that you can download on your phone, they give you that same control on the physical app. So if you, let's say, have your tripod set over here, you go to your phone, you go to the camera app, you can then set it to do the timer so that way you're not running back and forth to do it. Flipping the camera to the back side now, menu button, that is going to take you through the advanced settings of the camera. So the advanced settings can be anything from like your aspect ratio of the photo, the size of which it, what it looks like on the frame. The, uh, the menu button can take you to the way that it's saving your photos. Are you saving them as a JPEG, as a RAW file? Um, it can also get you into menu settings like your screen. Is your screen fully bright? Is it dim? You know, for battery saving, what video style are you recording in? Are you doing 4K, 1080, 7.2K? You can set all that stuff in the menu and that all will basically dictate the functionality of your camera, but it won't be the end results for your photo. That is just the way that your brains of your camera operates, but it doesn't necessarily dictate the photo. The stuff we've been talking about on the front end here, like your mode dial, like all these other things, that's what's really going to have the control on your camera. The menu is just going to give you greater length of detail in, let's say, photo quality or the, the space at which your photo is shaped. A lot of that stuff for a beginning photographer, for amateur photographers, it does not matter. So I wouldn't worry too much about the menu side of your camera, unless you're trying to get into more of a professional reign, and then that's where getting into the higher end cameras, you're going to really see where the menu button comes into play. Diapeter adjustments right underneath that, and typically you'll find that next to the viewfinder. For us four eye people, for the glasses wearers, I constantly have to play with my aperture, uh, diapeter adjustment. Because a lot of the times if I'm not using glass, if I have contacts in, my vision will be a little different, so I'll see through my viewfinder differently. But just like a pair of tel uh, binoculars or a telescope, you've got to readjust the telescope and the binoculars to different people who are using them. And that's where the diapeter adjustment comes in. So if you put your eye up to the viewfinder and then you start turning the diapeter, you should be able to see things clearer or more fuzzy by doing that. It's like going to the eye. that button again? Diapeter should be a little dial next to your viewfinder. So for you, it's going to be that dial right there. Oh, okay. So as you're looking through, you can play with it, go up or down, and that should give you a much more clear image through the viewfinder. First the eyesight, then the memory. <laughs> so from there, from the diapeter adjustment, now you've got your info button. Some of the cameras might have an eye button, which this camera has both. Um, but the info button will tell you information either on a certain menu function you're trying to do, but my favorite use of the button is when you've taken photos. When 
when you start really getting into it, and as you start using automatic as your main setting, let's say that you get a beautiful picture and you're like, wow, this is my favorite picture I've taken. You can click the info button and it'll actually break down the settings that the camera chose to use to take this picture. So if you're someone who really wants to learn how to use f-stop, uh, ISO, and shutter speed, and you're trying to really get the, the, to learn about how that all functions together, the info button might be a great way to do that. Because from there, you take your photo on automatic, you go, okay, the sun looked like this, we were outdoors, my subject matter was 20 feet in front of me, and my camera decided to do an f-stop of 2.8, shutter speed of 1 and 100, and my ISO was at 3200. That information is valuable because then it kind of educates you, the user, to realize what you need to be doing as far as um, manually setting the camera as you're taking pictures. Do that to your own comfort. Again, I, I think the, the, the hard part with cameras is people come into this and they want to jump into manual right away and they don't realize that the automatic settings on the cameras are almost perfect. So it's, you really can get away with shooting an automatic as a professional photographer. Um, for anybody who is a professional photographer who's hearing me say this, uh, we still love your work. Still love what you do. Uh, from there, you've got your focus and exposure lock. So focus and exposure lock, uh, the main purpose for this, and I always like to say it like this, is let's say you've got a family photo in front of you. You've got all the cousins lined up in front and you're ready to take a nice big picture. Maybe you want to get closer and take some pictures of everybody, right? What you can do is you can click that focus exposure lock. So it'll say AE-L or AF-L, and it'll lock the exposure and the focus that you have set up on the subject matter. So if you're this close to Cousin Billy and you set up and you're focusing on him, you can hold this button and it'll lock the exposure and the focus that it chose. And you can move the camera any which way that you want. It'll keep that consistent exposure and focus. So where that would be handy is if you have all these people lined up next to each other, rather than having to refocus the camera for every single picture, you could hold that button and just kind of sidestep and just keep taking pictures of people. Your distance from the subject matter isn't changing, and the lighting and everything else that's around the subject matter isn't changing. The only thing that's moving is you. Uh, but this will keep it consistent throughout the entire thing. Where is that button? I believe for you it is right in the center there. Key lock, yeah, that one's, I believe, if you're using the screen. Right, yeah, it's right here. Yep, it'll lock that guy. Yep. And then in between that is the other guy. Okay. From there, you got your image playback button. That's just below the focus and uh, exposure lock. And the image playback button's pretty simple. Click that button, it's going to play back the images for you, and then uh, you're able to go through the folder of, of what's on your SD. Probably card. mine's on the left, so they have the same exactly. type of symbol. Yep. Same symbol. It's just kind of like a standard industry pretty standard. Pretty standard symbol, yeah. Okay. All Almost right. all of this stuff is the same across every single can, uh, camera that you'll see. It's just every camera brand puts it in a different spot. Okay. Um, for so once you know what the symbols are, then... Exactly. Okay. And right. that's the beauty of this is because I could, I've been using this forever, and at the same time, while the camera itself is starting to become outdated, all of this information is still on every single camera that you see. Um, I button is just below that. Now, info and I can basically do the same thing depending on the camera. The other thing that the I button can become is a programmable button where you can set it to be, let's say, your video, or you can set it to immediately take you to this menu of the camera or that menu of the camera. Other times, it'll be the info button that'll tell you information on the camera. So everyone's is a little bit different. Some people don't even have an I button. From there, you've got your OK button. That's in the middle of your multi-selector. So as we were playing on yours, OK when you're in the menu is what you're going to click to then say yes or no to a certain question that your camera might be asking you. Uh, hitting OK might move you to the next slide. Hitting OK might um, change a setting on the camera. Your OK button is basically your Enter button on the keyboard. From there, your multi-selector is your arrow keys on there. So your multi-selector will help you move through the menus, um, change certain things, click through until you find the right image you're looking at, if it's at playback, that sort of thing. Underneath that, you have your magnifying button. Pretty self-explanatory. If you're in image playback, you can uh, magnify the photo 
And the nice part about doing that is you can look for blurriness and pixelation. And that's one way that I go about if I'm in a pinch and I need to look at a photo real quick. I'll determine whether or not the image meets my, my quality standards just by looking at it through the magnification. Underneath that, we have the delete button, also pretty self-explanatory. There's an image you don't like, you took a bad picture, you need to free some space up on the SD card in order to keep taking photos. You can click that delete button and it'll delete the photos that are there or delete whatever it is that you're trying to delete. And then underneath that is demagnify. So similar to magnify, let's say you've zoomed in a bunch, now you wanna zoom out, you can zoom out of that photo and then that way you're able to see maybe the photo as a, the whole picture if you're trying to get more of information on it. So the delete is a garbage can. Yep. I'm looking for my... You also might not have a button on the on the side of your camera. When you're in the image playback button, you might then on the bottom screen have a delete button that you oh, click okay. to delete. So, Some people might have that. So it's probably in the menu then. Probably in the menu system. Okay. So now we'll talk about the mode dial. We skipped over that, but the mode dial is the kind of like the engine of the oh, the sensor is really the engine of the car. That's what or of the camera. That's what does everything. This is basically your stick shift. This is what's putting you into the different types of mode for your car. So on most cameras, you're going to see something that looks like this. Um, that should be Nikon's old one on the side there. This one's going to be Sony on the bottom one, and then I believe that's Canon on the they all look very similar. You're going to see that A plus button on there. You're going to see for the most part manual, so M, AV for aperture, TV for shutter. Now it could also be SV for shutter as well too. Everybody does it a little bit differently on that one. I don't know what TV stands for. Shutter priority makes sense. Aperture priority makes sense. I don't know what the V actually stands for either. That's a question I've always had. Um, but regardless, that's what that means when you're getting there. On some cameras, you'll see C1, 2, 3. You might see one, uh, C1, C2. You might also just see it say 1 and 2. Um, that's your customized ones. If there's a certain setting as you're becoming more advanced that you really like, you can put that on the customized setting and it'll stay like that the entire time. So for example, let's say you're someone who likes to do the aperture on the camera, but you could care less about doing shutter and, um, uh, uh, shutter and ISO. You like controlling the aperture of the camera, but then you also like maybe a certain um, certain focusing um, motor, or you like a certain way the camera focuses. You can set that all on C1. Let's say you then move to take a video, or then you go back to automatic on the camera. Every time you go back to that customized setting, it'll always go back to where you had it before. So it'll always stay the same no matter how you change it. You can then change it back and forth however you like. You go back, it'll be like that. To break down all of them together though, I put this guy together. So auto or A plus, that's gonna be auto control over settings and functions of the entire camera. All you gotta do is point the thing, take a photo. Manual, that's full manual control over the camera's array of functions. So like I've said before, said it a few times, ISO, aperture, and then the uh, shutter speed. Those are the three main things they call the exposure triangle in the camera world. They all can function separately of each other, and then that's where the other priority controls come in, but they can also function together. And technically, when they're functioning all together, that's what's giving you the film-like photography, the very classic stance on photography that we've had for hundreds of years. A or AV stands for Aperture Priority Control. Again, some camera brands will do it a little bit differently. It's A or AV. Aperture controls the iris of the camera. So when you look at the camera itself, there's this kind of universal symbol for mechanical shutters where you'll see a hole and then basically it gets bigger or smaller. <clears throat> the way you can think about it, and I get a little more into it with my uh, intermediate camera class, is like your eyeball. When you go and you see that little black dot on your eye in the mirror, when you look at the sun, it gets smaller. When you look at it in the darkness, it's big. The same thing kind of goes for cameras. The more light that we want to come into the camera, the more wide open we're going to have it. The less light we want to have in, the smaller we're going to have it. Similar to how our eyes work, there's more to it for the aperture, but I'll save that for the next class, not to confuse. Shutter, S or TV, that's going to give you control over the speed of the shutter. Now what you're controlling there is how fast those shutters are going to open and close 
on the photo of what you're taking. Um, places where that's going to be really important would be like for sport photography, for wildlife photography. Anything where the speed of the, of the object or the subject that you're taking a picture of isn't determined or you don't know if it's going to start sprinting or if it's just going to stay where it's at, that's where shutter priority would come in to help. Um, the faster the object is moving, the faster you want shutter speed to go. The slower the subject's moving, the slower. P, that stands for program. You program the aperture and shutter speed. Those are both at auto, um, but everything else is changeable on the camera. So there's various settings and function modes. All of that stuff is something that you can change on program. And when you go back to it, no matter what you've changed on there, it'll always stay the same. But remember, whatever you changed it to the last time is what it's going to go back to every single time. Again, for most people, program not necessary. For more of my intermediate and pro photographers who have a very specific way they like to shoot for events and weddings and all this other stuff, program makes a lot of sense. B is one of my favorites because you can do long uh, exposure photography. And I get people, and, and you have a great camera for the example, the, the capability that you have for um, astrophotography. You can take pictures of the moon if you've got a clear night and the detail that you can get on the moon is uh, the lens, the way it extends, you get all that. But the way it would work would be through ball, B. And what B basically does is back in the day, someone would throw this little like carpet over their head, they would hold yeah. this thing in there and boom, just big thing of light, and they would take their photo. Bulb is kind of that same idea. Uh, in the 50s, we moved away from the powder and we moved into these bulbs that would then get attached to the side of the camera. They were blue and they would just light up and there's a specific popping noise you would hear. Bulb nowadays in the camera basically means that your shutter is going to stay open the whole time. And it's going to continuously take information from what you're taking a picture of. But where a tripod or something to stabilize it comes into handy is that if you move that camera at all, the image will be blurry immediately. And it, there's no way of fixing it. So, so if you can put it on a tripod mm -hmm. or put it down on like a park bench or a set of stones, like I get people who hike all the time and put it on the mountains. Um, if you can put it in a spot where it'll be flat and won't move, you can run it for as long as you want, and the longer you run it, the more detail you're going to get. So that's where a moonshot would be really cool with that. Some people will have bulb on there. If you don't see bulb on there, look at your shutter speed. That's where you might see B on the physical camera. On it. So it would be like in the program section? Actually, on your shutter spot there. So you've got it at auto, but you this? should see a B. Oh, I've got to put my cheaters on. See oh, I see the B. There yep. it is. So that's bold. Oh, cool. That's where yours is located. Oh, so rather than be on the mode dial, yours is on the shutter speed because that's what that's referring to. Okay. And older cameras, because they didn't have everything on the dial there, they would have put it on its own setting and then it would have just kept the shutter open the entire time. But when all else fails, you're brand new, you just bought a camera, you just want to take pictures of the grandkids or the kids or friends or family, whatever have you, start with automatic. It's the best way to get into the camera. It's the best way to learn. Is it perfect? No. And that's where learning manual, learning aperture, learning shutter should, in theory, give you better photos. But it requires time to learn what to look for with that sort of thing. You can listen to me till I'm blue in the face, but I can only show you so much without you getting out there and taking photos. One of the slides I think says it on here. Um, maybe I have it later. But one of the best ways to practice is just to get out there and take photos. Um, if you're going on vacation, you're going on lunch with somebody, if you're walking around a neighborhood you've never been in before, only one time in my life have I been stopped by somebody saying, why are you taking photos of everything? And I'm like, I just want to take photos. I'm like, I don't know. I just, the houses look pretty. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe it's some bearded guy who got creeped out. But uh, taking photos, going out, just exploring, using your camera, having fun with it, that's what the whole thing's for. As you're going and you'll learn more about it and you'll become more educated and you'll be able to do some really cool things with it. On some of the older cameras, and I keep it on here because this still is a thing, there's this mode called Scenes. Um, Sony has made it where they actually have it on the camera dial. It'll just say uh, Scenes, S-C-E-N-E-S. On something like this, which I believe is a Nikon, you're going to see all of these different modes. Um, scenes is just a fancier way of saying automatic. But what Scenes did for cameras was it made it more specific towards what you were trying to take a picture of. So, for example, you would have your A+, plus, your automatic. We all know what that is, that's your auto. Underneath that, you're going to have your light bulb, but it's going to have a line going through it. So it's still going to take a photo on automatic, 
but no matter how dark your camera reads outside to be, it'll never turn the flash on. Some people really like that. CA, I always, I always got a little confused on the CA functions. They got rid of it after a point in time, so you don't have to worry too much about it, at least from what I've seen. If you have an older model that has CA, if you have an older model that says CA, reach out to me. I'll do my digging to actually find out what it does perfectly for you. After that, you have this little floating head. The floating head was for portrait mode. Um, the portrait mode, pretty self-explanatory. If you were taking a picture of someone from their shoulders up, that was going to take the perfect portrait. From there, they would do uh, like a mountain. That would be your more scenic, your wide angle. The flower would be your close up. The guy who's running would be your action photography, and then the one square at the very end that has the white all around it, has a star, would be for nighttime photography. Now the beauty of it all is that they have made it so much simpler on the dial that they basically moved everything into automatic. So you don't have to necessarily focus on it with the newer camera structure on what those scenes do. If you're in automatic, you automatically have all access to those scenes. You just have to set your camera up and point at the point it the way that you want it to take the picture. Um, so this is my favorite. I get customers who come in all the time and they tell me I sold them a bad camera uh, and they, they, set, they show me this. Um, my camera doesn't work. Your camera does work. It's just the way that you're taking the pictures, whether that's the shutter speed, the nighttime, not focusing. Um, this took a picture. You just didn't take a clean, concise picture. So the next thing that we talk a little bit about, which seems pretty silly, self-explanatory um, is some posture and some other stuff. But before I do, I like to always mention your camera isn't a smartphone. I think we as a society have become so used to the fact that we have a beautiful camera on the back of our phones nowadays. The phone will take a great image every time. Don't get me wrong. Um, there's a lot of the things that a phone can't do that a camera can. There's a lot of things that a phone can do that a camera can't. And I think we have to keep both of those in mind. The biggest thing for why go for a camera than for from a why go from a phone to a camera is you want better images. You want images that you can maybe print, email, things that don't become pixelated, stuff that have much more detail to them. They they grasp whatever it is that you're trying to take a picture of better. They show color better. You bought a camera because you wanted to be something better than a cell phone. And from when you brought in, it's definitely better than even the most current iPhone and the current Samsung. Um, that being said. It's important to keep the two in mind. Uh, it's, it's, it always depends on who I'm teaching to because I have so many people that have used cameras before, they're only used to cameras, they love them, they can see the difference, and then I have the other generation of like, why do I need a camera, I have a phone. It's a whole argument. Here's where we're gonna get more into posture. So, with holding your camera, it's pretty self-explanatory, or maybe it isn't. But one of the things that we should always be looking for is where our arm placement is on the camera and where our back placement is. Um, in arts as a whole, because you're holding your hands in such small things, carpal tunnel and arthritis can grow at a higher rate than almost any other art form or craft because of the way that you're contorting your hands. So we want to prevent any of that stuff as much as possible and lower back pain as well too. So the first thing is always keep your back straight. You should be perpendicular to your subject matter. Obviously, for some people, they need to get into a crazy position to get a photo. Do what you can, um, but the rule of thought is a standard photo, you should have a straight back. From the front angle, your arms are your secondary most important thing. You'll, for the most part, have a neck strap on. This is both of you guys have neck straps. You might use tripods, so then again, it, it all is different. But you're on vacation, you're in Rome, you're, you're there to see the Vatican, you're not bringing a tripod. What you're doing is you're going to have your arms positioned in a way where you're supporting your shoulders and you're supporting the camera and your back as well. But what you're doing is you're basically doing, I call it the patio deck. If you look at the sides of people's houses, they've got a patio deck that comes off. Some people will have the supports that kind of arch down. Your arms are the arches or the support systems for your patio and your camera is the physical patio. So what you should be doing is using your arms, and it almost kind of looks like you're a velociraptor or a dinosaur, but you're using your arms to push into your sides. That's where your stability is coming from. If you pull on the strap that's around your neck and you put your arms into your sides, you're giving yourself much more stability than if you were to stick your arms out like this, than if you were to have your arms out like this, and even if you were to lightly put your arms down, this is still more stability than having your arms up. All you need is someone to bump you or something rocky, going to drop the camera or you're not going to focus right. You're going to get blurry photos. Using your elbows to kind of latch into your body 
will help in the long run of taking photos, even if you have a shaky hand. Focus, then shoot, and shoot through the whole picture. I get a lot of people that are trying to focus on one subject. If you're focusing on one subject, one of the things we'll talk about in here is fill the frame then so that your subject takes up the whole frame. But if you're focusing on like a sports game and you know your kid is running around and five other kids are running around, it's great to focus in on your one kid, but the chances are of you getting a blurry photo versus taking a clean photo and getting the whole image or greater when you're not focused in on the entire image, you focus on one aspect of it. So focus, shoot, and shoot through the whole picture, not just a segmented part of the picture. If your camera is moving, your pictures will become blurry. Um, unless you're using a crazy fast shutter speed on the, on the camera, if you're moving, you know, let's say like this, and you take a picture, you'll get blurred if you kind of slightly move as you take your picture or you're a little wobbly, chances are you won't have too much blur in the photo. But the more movement that's there, the more blur that can or will occur. So having stability, whether that's a tripod, having a neck strap on, some people even get, I've seen these goofy uh, chest harnesses that wrap around the back, and it almost has like an elastic band that comes off your chest. So you can literally pull your camera out, then put it right back, and then it'll just sit right on the front of your body. I don't know. I wouldn't wear it, but some people do. Yeah. Or don't some cameras have this automatic, uh, you know, so you're moving around? They're going to have stabilization, absolutely. But the stabilization... Well, these cameras come with stabilization? Yeah, yeah, both of them. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. DSLRs, uh, the mirrored cameras, are the ones that don't have any stabilization. And that was because the mirror was positioned in a way that if the mirror moved a little bit, you'd get blurriness on the image. Tripods were necessary for that. For the most part... These guys have built-in stabilization. Now, the stabilization that most of these cameras are referring to is for their video aspect. Photo and the video go hand in hand, so it's still there. But if you're moving and, and you're taking a photo, because you're taking a still image, if your hand moves in a slight way, it can be picked up on the camera. Okay. So it's not impervious to it. It's definitely better than its older predecessors, but it's not perfect. Okay. Um, so I have the neck strap on to, say, to be the most safe. And if you're doing something like maybe taking pictures of the Rocky Mountains or something and you're going to be out there one time, you want to make sure you get it, a tripod might be nice for that. You get a light aluminum tripod for 40 50 bucks. So the basics for taking great photos, and then this is kind of how we end the class. Um, I go through, and these are tips and tricks I've learned through schooling, through practice, on how to get a better picture. So one of the first things I mentioned was filling the frame. I'm going to throw out terms. I'll explain the terms as I throw them out. Here we have a portrait of a woman. The portrait on the left is our bad image, and the portrait on the right is our cleaner image. The reason I say that it's a bad image on the left is because we have all this extra negative space. There's negative and positive space when we look at artwork. Negative space is referring to the parts of the photo that are not what we care about. So in this case, the wall, the ugly shadows, the lines on the baseboard of the wall, those are all negative space. Our main primary focus is the woman, whether this is for a headshot, for a audition thing, or this is for her Facebook profile, or whether she just wants to frame a nice picture to send to grandma and grandpa. This is what she's going with. By filling the frame, we get rid of the negative space, and we're mainly focused on our main subject matter, which would be the woman here. Eyes on the top third of the photo. When you're taking a photo of somebody, because of the way that our heads are shaped, Technically, our eyes fall in the top upper section of our head. They almost, our nose basically hits the median point, um, just the tip of the bridge of the nose where the actual bones meets the cartilage that can break so easily. That's already there on our nose. Then there is the brow line, which is basically the start of the top third of our head, and then our top third of our head goes up. So the eyes are just below the eyebrows, so they're basically just in the top third. So when we're taking a photo of somebody, if we can keep their eyes in the cl close to or in the top third of the photo, so if I break this down, and I have an image that comes through later that shows it. So if I put a line there, and I put a line there, I've broken the photo into three sections. Keeping the eyes as close to the top third makes it more visually stimulating and pleasing for humans, and our eyes naturally gravitate towards that subject matter too. Now in this case, he has a pink shirt on, it's a bright shirt. So if you were to hang this up in the house, two things can happen. One, you might notice his eyes first. You also might be gravitating towards the pink shirt because it is the brightest part of the whole picture.
there's like a bright light from me. That too. It's it's coming like over his head. Exactly. It's actually making the shirt look extra bright. Exactly. And we talk about lighting on one of the next slides too, about having lighting in the back and how important it can be to open yourself up to light. Okay. <clears throat> Next thing is to focus on the eyes. So with humans, Nikon's awesome about it. Nikon has one of the most advanced eye tracking systems out of all the cameras out there. So when you're taking pictures of humans and animals, you actually can lock on to their eye to keep the focused and stability. That's the first thing it does in this thing. Yeah, and, and, and you, can, you can set it to not do that. You can set it to do that. Some people love it, some people hate it. But it's a really awesome feature because for a lot of people in photography, the eyes do have a lot of information to them. They're, part, I would say, partly the most colorful or interesting part of our body. So humans are naturally attracted to that for looking at photos. So emphasizing the eyes or showing off the eyes in a lot of photos can really help, can really make things look prettier or more substantial. So getting on their level, one of the things for photography that we can do is if we take things from above, we kind of create this elitist or this hierarchy scale. If you look at an old like Ghostbusters poster or let's say like an old Star Wars poster, you would see like Darth Vader, Emperor Palpatine on the top and then it would show like Luke Skywalker below and then all the other like non-main characters below that. You basically get this pyramid of characters. You're kind of getting a similar effect where if you're the photographer, you're up here and the people that you're taking pictures are below you. So you're basically putting the emphasis that the people that you're taking pictures are, are below. Not saying that it's not, not it's something you would necessarily pick up on every time you did it, but to the average viewer or somebody else, they might not, they might pick up on those things and be less interested in the photo. So where it then becomes cool is that if you can get your body physically lower and get on the level of the kids, you can take a much more interesting shot where you're giving the kids or let's say the smaller subject matter more, more power. Um, when I go to the Science and Industry Museum, they've got the trains that go around the downtown Chicago, take you through the mountains. Whenever I take pictures of them, I try to avoid me taking pictures like this or like this. I always try to get low with it because if I can make those trains and cars look lifelike, I feel like that's where then the cool of the photo comes out where it looks really awesome. Same thing with kids. You give them a little bit more power when you take them on their eye level. The next thing to that, though, is that you can sit below them. So you can go lower than them. Having the subject matter positioned in a way where their eyes or their heads are above the top third or close to that top third and making them look like they're looking down at the subject matter or to the viewer gives the photo or the group in the picture more power, um, which can then also invigorate or inspire the audience to feel a certain way about the photo. So again, for family photography, taking something like the first image is probably just fine. You get a picture of the kid's birthday party, you're happy. But let's say you want to frame something or send something out, to, uh, you know, say thanks for coming out to this person's birthday party or you know, your grandkids or anybody, they're tiny, but you want to get a really nice picture of them to frame in the house. Dipping yourself down a little bit lower, sitting in the chair, taking a picture of them, it might pay off in the long run and give you a cleaner image. Or having them maybe sit on the couch, you sit on the floor, and you're taking a picture up at them um, would also give that kind of more provenance to the photo and give it a little bit more. Now we'll break down the rule of thirds a little bit more. So we have two ways that the rule of thirds can go. It can go top, middle, and bottom, or it can go left, center, and right. Regardless, though, the rule of thirds breaks things down, and if you can continuously keep your subject matter between one of those thirds, um, it should be more visually stimulating to the person who's viewing it. Now, the sweet spot spots for that info or for that photo would be where those lines intersect. So that red circle is kind of the sweet spot for all of those photos. If you can position your photo in any one or subject in any one of those four dots, you help the you help the instruct the viewer for the way that they're supposed to look at the photo. So examples I have of that. Got my surfer dude on the side. We got a lot of beach photos. It's a great way to use the beach. I'm going to throw another term in here. It's called the horizon line. Horizon line is the line in which our sky meets our land. 
Um, water, all that stuff has nothing to play into it. It just helps that we have the visualization. The beach makes a horizon line even easier to see. If you're in farm country, you're driving down the expressway, you're used to it where the sky meets the very end of the expressway that you're just endlessly going towards. Same idea here. So from this, we can see that we have a much larger foreground than a background because of how high up our horizon line is. If our horizon line was even higher, we would basically only have land, really not have any background, or our perception would change a little bit, right? In this case, our surfer is sitting perfectly in between two of our circles, and because of the way that the sunlight is positioned on him, it creates a harsh, dark shadow around the subject, but that then trickles down below his feet. So we get him hitting the sweet spot on both sides, good color going through the whole thing. Um, and for the most part, he is in the top third of our photo. I'd say half of his body is. If you include the surfboard, more than half is in there. So um, a good example of using the rule of thirds to create a more visually stimulating photo. Another one, we have a little girl who's on the beach. So you've got your horizon line going in the back. You've got your sky needing your water. You've got light breaking through the clouds. So we can't really necessarily tell how gloomy of a day it is. But given where the sunlight's coming in, you can see that it's hitting her on the front, or at least partially on the front, because this area is not exposed to sun, I would say, for the most part. Um, illuminates her jean jacket a little bit more, shows the wrinkles in her skirt but she's hitting the rule of thirds perfectly. Her ankle is at the bottom circle and her shoulder is at the top circle. Um, and her head would be in the top third, not majority of her body, but again, she is in that rule of thirds category, so it should still be a visually in, uh, stimulating photo. Now we got a family fo a photo here. So we've got mom and dad on the right side, brother and sister on the left. The only thing of this photo that drives me nuts is that I wish that mom Dad could just scooch over just a little bit more so they were perfectly in line like brother and sister are. But anyway, um, I like this one a lot because you do get the idea of the fact that they're both sitting on their rule of thirds. For the most part, the tallest of the two are in the top, thir uh, top third. So the wife and the husband are there and then the daughter's head. The son being shorter, he's in below. But because they're both on that uh, rule of third line perfectly, they, they match up pretty well. Um, the symmetry of the photo is there, slightly off given, but if you crop the photo in a little bit more, maybe delete some of the excess space on the side, you would naturally get them a little bit more centered so you'd get that rule of thirds. Anybody who's watched The Office, you're familiar with how they do these scenes in the uh, one room. This is an example of how not everything I say is meant to be taken 100%. In the first slide I say get rid of gutter space, fill the frame. In this case, you have all this extra information, the, gut, uh, the shutters from the window, the tree in the background. For something like the show, like The Office, this was a perfect way of subtly telling you where the character was located inside the office. Anybody who's watched the show would know that this is their conference room that they're in. They have the window and the tree in the, in the room. Um, so it's a visual cue to the fans to tell them, hey, this is where your character is sitting right now. Now, if you were to make this for maybe a LinkedIn or a Facebook, you probably want to center and maybe get rid of the window, move the tree out of the way, and just take a picture on the blank wall. But you might also want to do it like this. Regardless, though, Jim hits the rule of thirds pretty perfectly. His face isn't 100% lined up, but he's on those marks. His eyebrows are above, but his regular eyes aren't. So the top of his head is technically in the top third of the photo. <laughs> if he could just position his head up a little bit higher, he would have been, the eyes would have been in the top third. But given how tall his hair is going up and everything, they probably did this for the camera angle. Still looks pretty nice though. And the la one of the last things we talk about sun on the back. So yeah. when you're taking a photo, it's important that you open your subject, or you open yourself up to the light and you remember that everything can reflect surface, uh, light surfaces. Um, so in this case, and I've had this argument with a couple customers, but it is true, these photos were taken with the same exact settings on the camera. There's just differences on how they took the photos. So the sunlight didn't move, the exposure didn't change, the ISO didn't change, shutter, nothing changed. What happened here was that the person in the first photo, he, the male, he's got his fish in front of him, and he's got the stick off in front of him too, and he basically is closing himself up, not allowing any sun to come in. 
the fish itself naturally will get a reflection of sunlight off of it because it scales, it's slimy, it's metallic. So it has light to share for the photo. So just by this gentleman dropping his shoulder back to allow the sun to come over his shoulder, moving the fish from directly in front of him to off to the side, and then moving the stick so it's not hanging off the one side, it's moved over. He's allowing that light to come over, hit the fish, which is then illuminating him more and bringing more light to the photo. So just by a simple body posture change and moving things around to incorporate the natural sunlight that's in the photo, you're able to get a cleaner photo if you know what to look for. So keeping the sun at your back, having it peek over your subject matter, or if you're at the perfect time of the day getting it where the sun is perfectly above your head, it'll help reduce shadows, it'll help keep the glare out of things, and it'll help illuminate the subject matter that you're trying to take pictures of. So sunlight, light, all very important things. And the last thing, use your timer and your camera app. Again, both Nikons that you have here have an app that you can download on your phone. If you feel comfortable using the phone and using the capabilities, I definitely recommend downloading it. Go on YouTube to look up the connection stuff. I personally don't shoot with a Nikon. I shoot with Fuji and with a Sony. Um, so mine are a little bit different. But if you look up the Nikon app, they should give you the very simple instructions on how to do it. From there, you can get features like timer, where you set your camera over, you can pull your phone out, you can say take the photo, it'll count down on the photo phone, and you can you know, position yourself to get your picture. Um, if you want to transfer images, you can. And some of these photos too, these apps also have editing services on there too, so you can change the exposure. You can change the hue, the saturation, the light, and that's all included just because you bought the camera, you downloaded the app on your phone. So like the subject matter did this, he took the picture of himself. Yes. That's what you're saying? That's yep. The third. Yep. So and he, he, he had, knew he had an X amount of time, he could stand out there. He did that, but for this photo in particular, <laughs> they used their phone. So they had it on their phone, they set the app up on the phone. They so you could actually look at the, what the picture going to look yeah, like. Exactly, before yeah. So when you move, it'll give you a live view of what your camera has on there. Okay. So you can basically set it up, walk in front of it, you know, position yourself, say, okay, this, this looks good. It's like a Bluetooth sort of exactly. application. Yep. It goes through Wi-Fi. So Wi it goes, instead of using Bluetooth, it'll go through the Wi-Fi feature on your phone. It's a stronger connection. So you'll keep the connection between a phone and Wi-Fi, let's say for 60, 70 feet, Whereas Bluetooth can typically range out anywhere between like 40 and 60 feet, depending. Oh, okay. And the Wi-Fi signal is uh, much more reliable. The thing with Wi-Fi, though, is it's it's similar to like Bluetooth, where you can only have one connection going at the same time. Okay. So like you can have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi running at the same time, but you can only have one Wi-Fi source, one Bluetooth source. You can't have two Wi-Fis and two Bluetooths, that sort of thing. Question is, wh where's the Wi-Fi source from? The camera or from the phone? It's coming from both. So the, the, the basically when you download the app, the phone itself or the camera itself turns into like a Wi-Fi hotspot. Okay. So it's pushing the signal out, then it allows your phone to connect to it. So your phone basically becomes a connected accessory to your camera. <coughs> so this isn't charge, this is just slave. This would be like the master. Exactly. And then that would be the okay. exactly. All right. exactly. And then from there, so anybody who's just getting started, you're on a budget, right off the bat, you need a camera, a lens, and a memory card. Those are the only three things that you need to get started. Definitely would recommend getting a strap. Um, easy to carry around, best to have. Get an extra memory card. You should always have two just to be on the safe side. Get yourself an extra battery. If there's any accessory on here I could tell you to get more than anything, having an extra battery. I went to Washington, D.C. last February so a year ago and I remember I was in Arlington I just finished up at the Kennedy I was just getting up to Robert E. Lee and I'm walking down I'm like perfect I'm gonna go across the Potomac and get back into the Capitol and I'm walking and I'm taking photos and my camera battery just went and I'm like okay I have this scheduled this scheduled and I now I gotta run back to the hotel room get my other battery get back out there I would have just had the battery I would have saved myself like $20 in Ubers but if you can carry around and walk with a battery and have one with you you'll be Glad you have it even if you don't use it, just in case. Temperature plays an effect on battery, so if it's warmer, it's cold in a climate. The warmer or the colder it is, it will exhaust the battery faster. Um, now, I'm talking extreme temperatures. Like once we get to July, downtown Chicago, and it's 110 degrees everywhere, and the humidity's through the roof, your camera battery will die a little bit quicker. 
when you're in the cold months of February and it's negative 15 below zero, that's where your camera battery will die quicker. You know, it's a 60, 70 degree day outside, the sun's partially clouded, your camera should be totally fine. But from there, getting a bag is great, getting lens cleaning kits. I also do the Chicago Polar Plunge. I take photos and do event stuff for that. And every time I go, I have to bring a brand new cleaning cloth with me because I sit in the lake while people are jumping in and I take pictures. I have to take my rag out and clean my glass and take pictures. And if I didn't have that, I'd have blurry photos left and right. Get a tripod. If you got a shaky hand, you're doing nature photography, a tripod's great. External hard drive, we talked about at the beginning of the class. I think they're useful unless you like cloud-based storages and you're comfortable with that. Various filters. Um, you know, there's polarizing, there's UV, there's um, neutral density, there's even film-like filters and cinematic filters, filters that will make your photos look three-dimensional, like all sorts of things. Additional classes, or sorry, additional lenses. Um, when you bought your camera, for you, different story because yours is all in one, but for you when you got your camera, you got the kit lens. That's the right. starter lens, the very beginning point. From there, as you're learning and taking photos with that, and you're like, okay, I like doing this with the camera, I like doing this with the camera, that's where you educate yourself more, and you're like, okay, what lenses do I need to get that'll give me a crisper image for you know, portrait photography, or for wildlife photography, or for sports? There's a lot of lenses that'll cross over and do a bunch of the same things, but there's certain lenses that are better built for certain types of settings or environments, depending. And then additional classes and workshops. Anybody who is a camera person or buys a camera, you should consider yourself a forever student. You will always be in some form of class, workshop, clubs. I have one, uh, she's a really sweet lady who comes in all the time. She wasn't here today, but she's part of a group that uh, is out of the Chicago Botanic Gardens. They meet up every week to take photos together. And then they have a big contest at the end of the month, every month, and they all hang up their photos and they all pick who wins. Whoever wins gets to have their uh, picture put in the Chicago Botanical uh, News Bulletin. So, you know, I have uh, another group that comes in that buys lenses and filters from me, and they're part of the O'Hare uh, the O'Hare Camera Club. There is a special group that gets access from the O'Hare Airport where they're allowed to sit in the section of the runway and take pictures of the planes as they land and they go up. They're awesome. Um, get involved with that sort of thing. A lot of the times from trial and error, that's where you're going to learn the most information on. Um, then there's camera classes too that you can sign up and take that cost money, but a lot of the times these groups are free. You just got to spend some time and work with them and talk with them. And that is it for me. Uh, nobody asked any questions on the online platform, so we're good there. Um, but I'd open it up if you guys have any questions now. It would be the best time to ask. There we four minutes. Good. I need to practice more. Understandable. That's usually where I, there's a lot of information in the first class. It's a lot of basic stuff, but there's just so much that kind of goes out of you at once. What's the button here again? This was, there's plus three and minus. That's three. the exposure compensation. So as you change that number, it'll lighten, it'll overexpose or underexpose your photos. Oh, okay. So when you got it on automatic and you're looking to take a picture, Turn the dial up one way, turn the dial down the other way, Just and you'll see, see what you'll see how it goes real light or real dark. Okay, all right, okay. And then you have the same thing, yours is that other button on there, exactly. This one here. Situations where I would use that, so let's say I'm in an indoor setting. Um, a lot of the times when you're in indoor places, you'll turn your ISO up a certain amount, and then the photo will look really grainy or pixelated. It doesn't look right because it's too dark. So what you'll do is you would turn the ISO down a little bit, and then you can use your exposure compensation to see if you can cheat to get the image the way that you want it. Um, helps in darker situations. That's why I would really recommend it. How about it. using the flash? Flash is all dependent. If it's very bright in the background and you're sitting in a shadow. Flash would probably be the best for that situation, just to have it on there. If that flash is overpowering, you can always go to your settings on the camera, and there should be a section in the settings about flash. And it should show you like strong, non-strong, medium, weak. You can set it so that it'll lower the like intensity of the flash as it goes out. And that still isn't what you want. Then there's options because you've got on here, which is called a hot shoe mount. Right. You can slide a flash on. Those guys sell anywhere between, I think, cheapest, about 50 bucks. Most expensive can be hundreds of dollars. For you, I probably would say something like 50 to 100 bucks would be perfect for that camera. 
but I do think the flash you have on there should be more than enough for most every photographer, photo situation. Oh, I like to take pictures of birds, and lately when I've been taking them right off my patio where the feeder is, the birds come out very dark. Mm -hmm. So that's what I need to adjust. Yeah, this. play with the exposure compensation, okay. and if that still doesn't work, in the intermediate class, we'll talk about ISO. And ISO is our way of uh, turning up the, in, uh, the sensor's brightness capabilities on the camera. So the higher we turn that ISO, the more susceptible the light the camera becomes. Therefore, it floods the camera with more light. So if we're having issues where the burn is coming out too dark when we're shooting, most of the time if we turn that ISO up a little bit, it'll help. But if we start playing with that, now we're not in automatic anymore. Now we're in those fancier settings okay. on the camera. So start with exposure compensation, see if that helps. And then if that doesn't, for next class, next week, we're going to get into more of those heavier details on exposure, ISO, shutter, and then aperture. Okay, great. Thank you. The one thing I'm a little confused about, you showed me earlier and the thing compacted itself. What no, is what's keep, the button? Keep turning it towards that direction. This way? I'm sorry, the other direction. Keep turning, keep turning. Now right there, you're going to notice a little tape. Yep. Oh. Oh, and there's a catch. Yeah, there's a little bit of a catch there. Okay. So that'll right. close it so that way it's compact and travel ready. And then okay. the only thing it'll do is when you try to use it on the camera, it'll basically give you an error message until you turn it back to that system. Okay. All right. This is a question that does not concern the cameras. But my wife has been having trouble downloading her pictures off of her uh, Android phone onto the computer. Okay. We bought different uh, tables for it, yeah. this and that, and nothing wrong. Yeah. Nothing wrong. If you had a chance to talk to our guys in the Connect Center. The Connect Center? The Connect. So, I'm so, so I use an iPhone. So with me, it's a little bit different yeah. because I connect to a MacBook at home. I've got Apple and everything. Okay. So it all works as an ecosystem and it's smooth. Okay. With Android, because everybody's got something a little bit different, whether it's Samsung, LG, yeah. uh, Google, they make it easy. Guys I would talk to are the ones who are working the connects oh, that are there. Okay. They should give you an easy way of doing it. And worst case scenario, if they don't, it's not by small electronics. That's on the other side over there. That's my department that I work in. I can always look the answer up and see if I can give you a more streamlined way. I see. Okay. okay. I was that. told uh, that we can fit, put the phone down next to the computer and it downloads the pictures. Mm -hmm. It has Windows 7 and it did download them, but then I had a hard time finding it. Got it. So it's probably location. The next thing I would talk to them about is like getting the photos on, but then what I would ask them is to make sure you understand where like the location of where they're going. Because you can change it to where they show up on the desktop. What I'll do for convenience sake is I usually make a brand new folder. Like anytime I'm bringing photos on, and I'll label it the month I took photos or the day I took photos. So like for me, uh, I was at the Cubs home opener last Thursday. That's why I didn't teach my camera class, but I talked the, the week before. But I, uh, I was at the home opener, and I took a bunch of photos, and I was getting ready to come home, so I made a folder on my computer that said Cubs home opener. When I transferred everything on there, I made sure the location of which it went to was that folder. And I knew exactly where that folder was, so when I went to click it, everything was on the folder. That's what I don't like about the new iPad. Windows 10, I have photos on iPad can make it a little uh, a little more hectic. The Windows and the Mac definitely. The computer interface makes it really easy to find everything. So I usually I, with photos and stuff, I, I typically tell people stick to the computer. Once you get a little bit better with it, the ease of the iPad or a tablet is really nice. But the computer makes everything out really easy for you to find and see right. everything and click and move. So. Yes. Well, I thank you very much. Right. Yeah, of thank course, you. guys. Thanks for Appreciate being here. Time. Anytime, anytime. And yeah, next week we'll be doing the same. We'll be next doing Thursday? Thursday. Next Thursday, uh, yes. Thursday, Thursday. It'll be same time, same ugly place, 5.30 to 7 uh, with myself. We'll be doing intermediate cameras. So for the next one, we're going to talk about the aperture, the shutter, and the ISO priority on the camera. We'll talk about lenses. We'll talk about a few more interesting techniques with taking photos. But the primary focus will be getting away from auto and learning how to use the rest of your camera. Ooh. That's hard. Yeah. More complicated. But one of the things I always tell people is I live stream these videos at the same time. So if any of this stuff went over your head, you want to review it, if you go to YouTube, type in Apt Electronics. Okay. On our YouTube page, I've got all the videos I've ever taught, so about almost a year's worth of these videos.
They're all on the YouTube page. You can rewatch all of them. Exactly. And if you look at you'll find them on there. It'll be camera class videos. You can leave any trash right here. I'll for you. Don't even worry about it. I'll take care of it, guys. Anytime. All right. All right. To all of my online viewers, thanks for joining. You guys, I appreciate having you on. Um, as always, my name is Saxon. Thanks for viewing. Um, if you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can reach me at my email, email and phone number provided on the side there. Uh, my days off are Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and we teach the camera class every Thursday except for the third Thursday of the month. So the first, the second, and the last Thursday of every month. So next Thursday, April. Drum roll, please. April 13th, we'll be teaching the intermediate camera class starting at 5.30 here on the app to you.